Hello, everybody, and welcome to our world today, the unionist perspective. Today, we're looking at a few topics that we believe are starting to just highlight that there are quite a few moving parts in politics, but there doesn't seem to, in world politics, but there doesn't seem to be significant forward momentum or significant conversations in the right direction. So there's a sense of posturing around all of these things. And then you have certain countries that also then start to make some very tough calls that just on the surface of it starts to almost make us nervous about what human rights are in those in those countries and what constitutional rights are in those countries and primary speak for to me speaks to the el salvadorian shift around cracking down on crime which has seen the suspension of constitutional rights of gang members and things like that and i'm going to hand over to sage to give us just a nice sense of an intro in terms of what has happened in that space, and we will evolve the conversation from there. Yeah, so um, as we've been reading more about it, so I've come up with like I found this picture of it. So El Salvador, for most of for this entire like um, the 21st century, like since 2000, it's been like, you know, a country with one of the highest crime rates and murder rates in, in the entire world. Um, the U.S. deported a bunch of Salvadorian gang members in the 90s. Like there was like apparently a lot of them were congregating in Los Angeles to try to like set up a gang uh, enterprise there. The U.S. Uh, government cracked down on that, sent them back to El Salvador. And since then, they've been like warring and like controlling lots of aspects of life in El Salvador. And meanwhile, the government has never really succeeded in providing good education and a lot of good services for people. So a lot of people are seeing the gangs as being an opportunity for them in the lack of the other opportunities. So <clears throat> the murder rate um, only started to decline in like 2015, 2016, when the government at the time made a deal with some salvage, some um, gang members who were in prison in exchange for giving some of the imprisoned high level leaders special treatment um, in prison, apparently, um, there was a deal that the gangs would stop killing people or stop killing as many people. And so that happened. Then predictably, like when you make a deal with essentially the devil, it's never gonna work in your favor. So in 2022, the gangs started a huge wave of uh, murder again, because they wanted more concessions. They wanted more, obviously. And so then that's at that time that Bukele was president. So Nayib Bukele is the current president. He's been since 2019. And he was like, <clears throat> yeah, enough with this basically, like we're gonna crack down very, very harshly. And so in like March of 2022, this all started. So yeah, he basically, um, apparently he's called himself the world's coolest dictator. So I think he sees himself as like a benevolent, a benevolent dictator kind of dude. And he is saying he's basically like he brought the military in to coerce a vote in the legislature to say you will vote yes for more funding for military and police and that went through he got the funding and did this huge crackdown and suspended constitutional rights meaning the police can search you there's no trial there's no lawyer there's no communication uh with the outside world and they've since arrested like sixty-six thousand people you know, and put them in the giant prisons. So yeah, it's crazy. The murder rate has gone down there 97% since the end of 2021, like Yuri was saying, and like we've been saying. 
So some Salvadorians are obviously like really, really happy about that because like the gangs have been terrorizing people's lives. Like they've been collecting protection money, you know, from businesses and from people and everything for like a long time. And so there's that on the one hand. On the other hand, the problem is, <clears throat> well, A, like people not necessarily going through the legal, legal process properly because so far not many people have actually had a trial or anything of the sort. Um, and also that, well, they've expanded the prison census to 45 years for like gang members and up to 10 years for, for children. Like, so if a child is working with the gang, sometimes they use children uh, for certain things in the gangs. The child can be sentenced to a decade in prison. Um, apparently, we don't know when the trial is going to happen. And some people say like one in every six people arrested is actually innocent. Um, so that's been a huge issue too for people because the police can, you. it's up to you to convince them essentially that you're innocent. And if they think that you're guilty, they'll just bring you in because they have a quota to meet for arrests. So it's like, it's kind of, to me, like the more I've read about the story, the more it feels like kind of a mixed bag. And it just raises questions about like, what's really necessary here and what isn't and like why this is all happening basically. And it speaks maybe to the emotional pain in El Salvador because people have for more than 20 years have been uh, experiencing suffering with the gangs. So people's appetite for an extreme approach might have been really increased by all of that. So I don't know. What do you guys think about that? What do you feel about that? I think it's a pretty interesting perspective, um, which I want to add more context to in terms of how it works in South America. Um, because I was like literally just watching a documentary or some sort of documentary show about drugs smugglers uh, in South America um, that were basically used as pawns, just like these children, um, in the biggest scheme and not always told like what to do, where to go, until like very end, very controlled and things like that. And um, not to say that they don't have responsibility for what they're doing, but like a Peruvian prosecutor um, was talking about that and she said like, I don't care what you do um, in the drug chain, you're going to pay for the consequences of like making that choice. And I think it's really telling about like the dire need for safety in Central and South America to the extent that people would do anything to stop it. And I understand the story better because 97% reduction rate without being like negative or optimistic is a whole lot in just under a year. <clears throat> a whole, whole lot. Like, you have to put a whole lot of people in prison like we like we saw last week to do that. And I think in the way it is presented, especially by media towards the world, it seems like a pretty normal thing. Like he comes in, cracks crack down the crime rate, uh, becomes like... Um, some type of ideal for the rest of South America. People are happy because they have some type of relief from this belief in, in scarcity and poverty and crime and violence. And so they want to reelect him in 2024, which is funny, like I didn't mention, but there is a presidential election next year. So pretty on par with like all that we've seen in other countries but when you go deeper like that is like the coolest dictator um 
and he's pretty charismatic in his way of communicating. Even though he seems like very close to the poor, um, and the way that like, he really like forced the hand of people to go beyond the constitution to to make this happen, um, would make us feel like, hey, like he did arrive at a result, but just like anyone, like you can arrive at result through extreme control, and sometimes it works sometimes for several years but um it will probably not i i guess it's not really viable because like same as any country that we've seen and the decision that we see with humans like the foundation of it is not good and the sickness um the issue are not resolved so that's how i see it um, in the context of like putting into perspective what you said in terms of like internal politics and also what we know about South America and like the really the suffering that people are in and, and I can understand why um, this would feel like the best situation because like my god like not being threatened to be murdered every day that must feel pretty relieving you know. So, so I'm, I, I hear what you're saying, and I guess it seems like very extreme measures. And you know, there's a there's a part of me that, when we put it into the perspective of desperate times, call for desperate measures. Then you kind of it kind of almost justifies it on a level, and the you know it's almost the the, the the human rights lawyer in me who wants to go well you sacrificed your human rights when you perpetrated crimes against somebody else's human rights so you know and, and I, I, get, I get it you know like it might seem like there's an energy of tit for tat so I took this away from somebody so I lose it I, I just feel like sometimes because we have so many civil laws that require us to honor the rights of people that perpetrate crime, and then they get off of charges because a part of a process wasn't followed or an extreme measure was applied or the chain of evidence was broken there's always some there's, there's a lot of loopholes that get lost because we have so many processes attached to processing criminals so you know it, it, it's a little bit of a catch-22 situation where i want to almost applaud them for the extreme measure but at the same time also want to go well if we applaud the extreme measure what are we opening up the door for in terms of having set this type of precedent because you we've already we've noticed well we've noted in the stories and the news reports that they ex they they the almost exceptions process has been extended thirteen times, uh, and which what it was meant to be a month, a process over a month to crack down on crime, that has been extended thirteen times. So, my sense is that the strong arming is allowing for a protracted process and yes people are going to find value in cleaner safer streets in healthier well it just in the ability to actually not have to pay for protection and all sorts of other weird and wonderful things that we've read in these stories in terms of gang protection and territorial fights and all of those things so so I firmly believe that there's definitely a section of the population that would applaud them. And in all honesty, if I was in those kind of in those circumstances, I might also applaud them and I might also support 
this level of crackdown. My concern is the precedent that this type of crackdown sets because we have a person that's very charismatic but also has some power at his disposal and unfortunately we know that absolute power absolutely corrupts so at which point does he stop being for the people and start being for himself under the guise of still being for the people I think you have to be very clear on your intention there. And when we knew only part of the story about like a crime reduction way, it seemed like he had good intention for the people. And I think in some type of way he does, but also that there is something that we mustn't forget is that justice, however tarnished and imperfect it is on earth, is still kind of um, inspired from divine justice. And so sometimes we see um, decisions that we don't understand at the time and maybe that make more sense afterwards. And I'm thinking about some decisions that were made like during Black Lives Matter and comparing them to El Salvador right now, I would say that if justice had made a very precise type of decision, it would have transformed people into um, social and political pariahs instead of actually bringing justice and peace to the country and to the world because it was made out of anger. It would have been made out of anger. And so I find myself, the more we talk about El Salvador, I find myself making these parallels and i think like there is a lot of like anger that we didn't see before that is playing into account and i really see the social barriers there and first of all there is the first problem that sage mentioned and explained very well is that one out of six people are innocent and uh put into sentence that completely turn over their lives but also like in making them social barriers and playing tit for tat and playing their game, you're not going to resolve a problem because nobody is going to feel the thoroughness of it all. It's just going to retaliate in some types of ways because like action, reaction, you know, spiritual lows and everything. And I just feel like, you know, Sometimes you may be angry at justice, but if justice does um, their thing well, meaning they are independent enough to make choices that are related to each of the cases, so fair trial, even when you go over the board, um, there is still that sense of fairness that says to the world that, hey, this is grounded and this is good. And even from the criminal side, it's like, okay, this is justice. And so there's this divine truth that settles in and it's like, yeah, okay, I accept it because this is true power, you know? And I, I say that because like, even in like genocide and things like that, you still don't go without a trial most of the time. So it's like, as... um. As tempting it can be to forego trials for the worst type of crimes and things like that, I think there are things that are beyond our understanding that truly need that side of divine justice interventions. And just knowing that, you know, a lot of people, spiritually speaking, um, lawyers and doctors are accompanied by people that help them on the other side to do their job correctly you know sometimes not always but still and so <laughs> there is just this perspective of like we can see justice in the place of lack but we can also see it as um i guess the, the glass half full type of perspective which is um there's still like a divine essence 
somewhere in there <laughs> that helps us <clears throat> not going to use some types of uh, earthly apocalypse, you know, because we're still like we're still making the choice to um, the choice of divinity. So, yeah, that's just like how we can go about it in spiritual perspective, and obviously, like. This may change because, you know, at, at a point in time, like we do our best with the information that we have and we don't always see the whole picture. But um, like the point is not to take side, but to really like feel um, what it is that is happening at the core and what we feel is happening at the core because we, as, as humanity, we do feel sometimes what is happening. And so... I guess this is like for now the complete picture that we have of El Salvador. And we know it couldn't be perfect, but it's good to see like intentions and choices and, and respect for the structures are also important, no matter how much you want to like go in and break everything up and then just like rage and uh and destroy all, all people that ever did bad because like you know we're still like divine children of God. Um but yeah this is more of a story. So uh, yeah that's just like spiritual perspective. <laughs> I think part of the uh, spiritual perspective that you should that did you mentioned that we also need to add to is if we consider that there's been collective pain in El Salvador for the longest time, and we consider that pain requires some type of remedy. So if you have a headache and you've had a headache indefinitely, at some point you're gonna see a doctor. At some point you're gonna take pain medication. At some point, something needs to be done to alleviate the pain. And so if we now look at the collective pain of a country and we see this level of remediation of that pain in, what, in, a, in a way that would probably not be a standard in many other places, we have to remember that you know, the, the pain has requ is requiring a response. And while the response might be extreme, it's still, to an extent, an effective response to the pain. Yeah, I think we can, we can deny the fact that it's just like a response. Um, yeah, but responses are grounded in choices, sometimes that are greater than our understanding. And so, yeah, we do have to take that into account. Like, obviously, we're not, um, we're not um, diminishing the pain that people are feeling in South America because their lives are just rigged with, like, gangs and drugs. Um, but yeah, we have to, to take all the components and, and see what picture is here for us today. Yeah, I missed a little bit of what Granville was saying, but the way I'm feeling is that this has to be a twofold. If the first fold is like, you know, getting, getting all the gang members and reducing crime rates, the second fold has to be a We're reducing her. <laughs> Bit of internet connection. I think she was going to say maybe the second fold was going to kind of like what we mentioned last week at the end, that we kind of need to- like, where. Uh, court system and you know uh, right aspect is my connection unstable that I come in and yeah, out uh, we, we kind of lost you at some point <laughs> yeah. can, you, can you repeat the second fold we heard the first one but the second aspect 
Okay, I choose to connect. connect. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the second fold is definitely doing the I've been going on for a year. Oh, man, did I again? Uh, oh, uh, would, would you like to disconnect and reconnect? Let's see if it reestablishes the connection at a better rate. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, I think the question is like, is the country going to follow up and do the dirty work? I think this is what she was going to say. Not sure. And really like um, think about a long-term plan because we do find that more often but not politics is about like short-term. It's about communication. It's about how people see you in power and not really about like having a true true grounded divine response to an issue so this is probably something that we'll have to see but i'm curious to know like uh other countries where political leaders are actually thinking long term enough to to act on their plan in a grounded way And I think that that's part of that's part of the that, that's part of where we ended last week, right? We we had this very significant sense of a lot of change being called in, but also not necessarily significant a, a significant sense that the change is leading to any type of solid delivery in terms of improving the lives of the citizens of those constituent countries. Um, we've, we've seen, we see that, for instance, there's a massive election in the US happening in 2024. South Africa is happening, having a massive election in 2024. I think there's the UK is also having a massive election in 2024. So there's, it seems like it, all of this, all of the, all of this is culminating in 2024 being the year of change and the year of choice. And we have that we have like the G20 that's just happened. We have BRICS that we have BRICS that's just happened. And there's a lot of rhetoric streaming out of it, but there's not necessarily significant plans that you can say, hey, I, we can sink our teeth into backing some of these things. Like one of the things was de-dollarizing trade for the BRICS company, your countries. So you, you, to de-dollarize something just sounds ridiculous when the world trade system is built on dollarization. It just, it, you know, it, the, the, the almost the extent of the, some of some of the changes being requested smacks of the ridiculous. And you kind of have to wonder how much of what is being discussed and proposed is truly grounded in what is in reality needed by humanity at this time? Yeah, very true. Nadja, are you with us? Do you want to try again? Uh, yes. So I was just saying that it has to be a twofold. Like if your intentions are pure on bringing um, justice to the people, not only are you cracking down on murder rates, but you have to follow through on the humanitarian rights too. If you're saying one out of six, Sage was saying, one out of six is in innocent. That's 11,000 people that are wrongfully uh, committed. And it's been a backlog of over a year of people not being able to bring up their case in court. So they have to speak for themselves. They have to express if they're innocent until proven like not. So yeah, it has to follow through into phase two, phase three, however many phases it has to go through. And I know we've all seen a point in history where the president puts a lot of power in the military and it goes completely array. And I don't feel in 
in my perspective, I don't feel that's the intention, but it could go that way. We don't know. I suppose Nadia touched on something that's quite important in we don't know. And I think that 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 is probably the biggest sense of what's happening here. So we, as, as you said, Yorin, we can we can kind of review what's happening and we can bring spiritual sense to it on what is known at any given time. But we always have to remember that the intent be below all of these choices and all of these actions does require a spiritual grounding that probably isn't as prevalent in world politics as we would like it to be. It probably isn't as prevalent in, gov in government, government structures the way we would like it to be. And I think when we, when we start to understand that there's always going to be a spiritual basis for a lot of things, specifically talking to things like the laws of karma, you know, the, the laws of the universe, the laws of the spirit world, we, we are going to start to see things that sometimes do not make logical sense, but spiritually might make sense if we allow ourselves to ground into unpacking the truth and calling forth the truth in those places. Yeah, exactly. And uh, thank you, Nadja. I was glad that you could express yourself on that point. Isaiah, did you want to add something? I, think, I don't know if you unmuted or not. Oh, um, yeah, I just wanted to say um, when Nadia was speaking and you were speaking about the like the humanitarian aspect of it, um, it seems like if we're looking at like a core choice here, um, like El Salvador would, needs to really choose that, right? And to move forward with that because it's like, why did this happen in the first place? Like it was almost like there was almost like anarchy, like there wasn't even government in the first place. And then so now that um, this is moving forward, it seems like it's going in the right direction. But I think for it to like settle into something that is really for the people that, well, yeah, the people have to make that choice. And obviously the leader um, has would have to follow suit with that as well. So I actually have a question that, that I want to just put table. And I, th I think it's something that we should explore because, again, it comes back to how we were viewing what would have been accepted practices in certain places. And almost it almost became quasi the culture of certain countries for those kind of criminal activities to be pervasive in society and for people to really feel threatened in just their general daily lives and things like that. And when you when you put it in the perspective of it's, of it's almost a quasi-culture, in order for that quasi-culture to be overhauled, it does probably require a level of extreme movement or maneuvering so that you can install a new practice, a new culture, a new way of being. So we, we also have to consider that this might actually just be the precursor to the change that they need, but it had to be this extreme for them to pay attention to the change that is required. Yeah, I, I agree with you because sometimes because now people have a taste of what it's like to have safety in El Salvador again. So that's cool. That's good. And it hadn't be, really been a very safe place since like, I think like the 80s, like the early 80s, because there was a, a huge civil war 
there for like almost 20 years too before this. So like that's important and people need to that. But like he said, it's a culture change. And so if more and more people can choose that um, safety and yeah, stability and like if the government and the people can partner on creating a society with better opportunities and with, like you said, more, more safety, then it will be good. If it's just one guy who like wants to like hold on to power and they want him to be like the savior, the Salvador, you know, to make a pun on this, um, that's probably not going to end well unless people all claim their power and it's a collective change in the culture. Because this, he's he was saying he wants to run for president again, but in their constitution, you can't. He, his term's over. Mm. But he's saying I'm going to run anyway. What kind of guy does that? He's like the the Trump of El Salvador, except much more um, like in terms of like flouting electoral law, but not in terms of like um, other things. So <laughs> you shouldn't. I feel like that's not cool. You, you should say, hey, you guys, do you want to change the Constitution? You shouldn't be like, I'm going to defy the Constitution. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That seems kind of, again, like, it could be tempting because people could be like, no, we need him. He's the guy who saved our country. And it's tempting. But like Granville was saying, where does that lead you? You know? So, yeah. yeah. I 100% agree with you. And I think, like, according to a lot, of people he would be re-elected there um just because like maybe they, they I do feel like they have this tendency talked about it before of like Central South America and the Caribbean of like thinking of like a government of saviors instead of making a choice for themselves um yeah. but that's my very point of view after like growing up like in proximity to some of these areas um i do have a feeling though it was something else there there is something about like again a spiritual low that earth is very dense in terms of choice like usually like in the universe if, if you make a choice you manifest that choice like that but on earth you don't and it's a good thing because like you don't manifest catastrophes if you have a choice of separation there. However, <laughs> um, in TFAS, like definitely I also say that um, it explains why even though you would elect any kind of extremist to the power, um, it would create a whole lot of chaos and, and movement, yes. But in terms of spiritual choices, it wouldn't do shit, if I can say so. Because the spiritual choice is way heavier to move. And so maybe um, that type of extreme movement can help in making a new choice. Maybe, probably, I don't know. Humans tend to do the contrary. They make a new choice when it's a dire situation. And they really need to get out of that crap. I do think like there is something that we need to watch and I would love to do, you know, we have a lot of things like preparing and I would love to do uh, like, um, you know, something about like a recap of 2023 and potentially what's going to happen for us in 2024 because it seems to be a big election year and things like that. I would love to say, see if there is not like some type of like extreme movement provoke like the elastic to snap back in some of the places, which is what we see already happening with the constitu constitu constitutional laws being um, overlooked. So just a thought out there. And I think... Maybe it's probably a good way to transition because we always talked about like the choices of bricks and how do we choose for the people or for our own personal power and um, our own corruption or our countries and things like that. To kind of look at uh, how this is playing out 
on the international scene because we had the G20 this week and a lot happened. And so um, to recap, like there was a G20. I, it's been a while, I think, since we actually had a, a G20. I think there was maybe a G18 or 17 some years back not an actual G20. So Russia was invited, right? And uh, there are a lot of countries <clears throat> in Africa, in India, that are invited too, because they're part of the G20. And I feel like it could have been significant, except um, on the political, geopolitical scale, right now it's kind of, um, I don't know. I, 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 I almost want to say it's kind of a hazardous game of, no, not poker, but you know what I mean? It's like, what are we going to have today on the plates? And last week it was BRICS, um, the new BRICS and the new coalition and getting out of um, the dollar uh, financial system and world economy, things like that. And right now, like, we have to really look at it hard to kind of understand what happened because what actually happened and is it something that has happened because we don't really understand like the divine plan that is being put in place or is it just some nonsense of like, a summit where no decision were really made, but like a whole bunch of things were said. And, and one of the big things is that um, anyone was had a consensus on saying that a lot of war crimes were committed, but they didn't name Russia, which for the media and um, they're being very cautious here, which for the media means, um, and also Ukraine, um, that Russia kind of came um, came out victor of the summit and in a surprising way. And Ukraine was like, hey, like you're saying you're doing shit for something, but you're not actually calling the bad guy out. And I wonder, like, is this some nonsense that happened? Is it because uh, the U.S. has been playing the politics of just being the strong guy that can destroy Russia in the snap of a finger, but undercover for now? Is it something that we don't know about? Because there are a lot of things that we don't know about. And so I kind of want to call out to your feelings and and like the spiritual truth here because we can go deep into saying like this is nonsense we don't understand the geopolitics right now and this feels like bad choices on bad choices but like what is underneath what, what's for us to discuss here i'm curious I don't, I don't know, like, what you guys can take from it, what we can take from it, like, because my feeling about this is that even though in the statement, they, they said, like, um, it's basically, they said, like, countries shouldn't invade other countries for territorial gain, and, like, that's what Russia's doing, but it's funny that Russia would even consider that a victory, because that's what they're doing. But Sergei Lavrov, their foreign minister who came because Putin couldn't come because he has an arrest warrant out against him. Um, he, in, he was speaking in front of everybody there and he was like, he literally said this war. So this, this conflict that we have because Ukraine attacked us, um, he literally said that statement, like Ukraine attacked us. And I was like, eh, yeah. No, that's so crazy. You know, they're so they're so insane. It's insane. And people laughed at him, you know, and rightfully so. I think they should have like shouted him off the stage, maybe even, but I don't know. I just I'm 
I don't like how much they tolerate Russia and these countries. And part of me feels like <clears throat> trying to create a statement that everybody agrees on is kind of a, a huge waste of effort and taxpayer dollars <laughs> because you're trying to get all these different countries to agree. And then they come out with this statement that like condemns countries for wars against other countries to take territory. And it like everybody is kind of semi-satisfied with it. Like people who think Russia is the aggressor are kind of satisfied and Russia is kind of satisfied. And then India is like, <clears throat> we had this great diplomatic victory because we brought everyone together and we got everyone to agree on something. And we're, we are the champions of neutrality, go neutrality. And I'm just like, no, like you guys can't do, you're, you're trying to ride a line, you know, like you get tons of your military, you get, you're in Russia's pocket because you get so much of your military equipment from them and you have since the seventies. So you're, you're bought, you're bought. But then you also, you know, are, want to appease the West because they are going to help you in your conflicts against China and stuff. So it's like, I don't see that as changing anything because India has been like this since the start of the war. The West is still going to be pro-Ukraine. Russia is still going to be, you know, with its, with its head up, you know, where, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, like being completely insane. I don't think it changes anything. I think it was just a really expensive way to keep doing the same thing. And I really am not a fan of <laughs> this. I don't know what you guys feel, but I feel very passionately that this accomplished nothing. <laughs> I don't know, but please tell me what you think. Yes, and also, isn't this the way we do things right now? It's like we have a summit or COP27 and we do a global statement of things we agreed on because we think globalization uh, saved our asses um, <laughs> a lot and we're going to do that again but then we do a statement that no one respects or no one truly believes in and I just feel like this year was just the rise of the like, very like singular individual initiative showing us that maybe just maybe what you said is the sentiment of the whole like and maybe my sentiment too is like oh there was a g20 like what's the purpose <laughs> what's the purpose of a g20 um in that context where nobody agrees with nobody and we know it and we have a statement that leaves nobody satisfied because nobody agrees with nobody. I, I don't think why, I don't know why we're surprised. I think that was my thoughts. Like, a G20, really? Like, is that going to solve anything? So, yeah. Well, my, my sense is that, you know, we, we see, we're seeing all these things. And my feeling is that there is a lot of posturing on a world stage, almost as if we are all at some or other concert, except it's like it's a bunch of artists that all play different genres in different languages. And, you know, there's no sense of the piano player knows what the guitar player knows the melody that the guitar player is playing and the singer is trying to sing the harmony as opposed to singing the melody so the song is a stuff up and feels like there's holes in the song they, there's no coordination of keys so somebody's playing an a minor while somebody else is playing a d flat and they're not actually sure what they're creating except a shitload of noise. And the fact of the matter is, if we were to consider that the monkey is on the lion's back, who's on the elephant's back, and the big top is on fire, it's a circus without, without leadership. And I think this is what we, we are seeing is this 
this world order seems to be almost fumbling, but there is the, an absence of something that could potentially solidly replace it that people would actually rally behind and support and contribute to. And then we have the very real economic reality that each country in their own right is struggling in some way to either service their debt or keep inflation under contr on control or manage trade relationships or manage supply and demand for their staff or having or are funneling significant amounts of money into loans for suspect contractors. It's just like, it feels like there is a, an uncoordinated mess on the surface of it. But we also have to remember that on the surface of it is probably five to six centimeters, millimeters deep. On the, on the bottom of it, there are still significant powers pulling strings. We're not seeing the strings being pulled just yet. So we have the sense of our politics of non-involvement, our politics of neutrality, our politics of trying to encourage people to come to the talks table, but what is actually happening underneath all of it? Because let's be honest, there are some very unusual bedfellows in some very unusual beds. Always with the funniest images. <laughs> but um I yeah I have a feeling and I think that goes back to like my question at the beginning of like why the purpose of the G20 and what we can feel into it. There is a level of nonsense. There are also a level of, and I don't think that's what's playing here. I think we have to remember what it was like in the Cold War. And there were like phase of decades of seemingly non-involvement, non-involvement. Fights were made in different ways. And it was a different time, right? People didn't want to go to war just yet because it was um, at the end of World War II and a lot of people were scarred and we saw that the disaster that it was in Vietnam and uh, things like that. But I think there might have been either way in any of the involvement of any country in that wars outside of their territories in, in, the, in the Cold War, or even like the non-involvement in terms of like, um, why don't we, why, does the, why doesn't the West attack the USSR? There must have been a lot of people saying like, what the heck is happening? What are we doing? What are we not doing an intervention? We need to make it like this, like this, like this. <clears throat> And now that we have the onlook of, that the years gave us, we know that uh, a lot more was playing um, out in secrecy than we thought. And we just accept that there were decades of non-involvement because that's part of history, that's part of the Cold War. Nobody questions it again. <laughs> Um, especially like not in, in the West, at least, like not in the things that we've been educated with. And so is that what is happening right now? Is that what is happening right now while the fight is happening in a different way? What are the diplomacy things that are being played out at G20? Maybe we feel like it's nonsense, but yeah. Still feel like sometimes some in some way it's kind of nonsense. But there's also like uh, whole teams in each countries which um jobs are 
to play with diplomacy bits at the summit. And it's not just the political leaders of each country. So what happens there? What is going on? And uh, maybe like statement, you know, it's a statement. So we had to have like a lot of conversation and Ukraine did make it public that they were displeased with that, but they kind of knew that a statement was going to be made. So was there like a lot of discussions on things that we don't know about? And then the public statement was just a public statement and Ukraine is doing what Ukraine does, which means saying like, hey, you guys don't do quite enough for us. <laughs> um, and because like, if they didn't do that, it, it would have felt abnormal to a lot of people. But like what actually happened behind closed doors at the summit? And yeah, I think it would be interesting. Like this is something that we don't have insight on, but I think it's important to say that it's also something that we, the media doesn't have insight on because we were, even though we feel like some parts of the summit is like, doesn't have any value to us. There was also a big jump by saying that everyone was agreeing with Russia, which they did not. <laughs> And Ukraine was fuming. So what was actually happening there? And I think something that you touched on that's very important to remember is that there's never not anything happening. And we know this because history has proven it. We know that there are always alliances of one form or another because there's always people benefiting from each other in one way or another. And while we might not see those relationships and the results of those relationships playing out immediately, in the long term, we absolutely will. We also will not see somebody that has absolute power in certain instances wield that power immediately because they do not want to reveal their hand. It's literally a poker game. Yeah, I want to reiterate that and say like, I feel that it's like a hiding game as well, hiding behind the neutrality and the chaos. And one example of that I saw was India introducing itself as Bharat. And as we know, there's like this ethnic religious cleansing that's going on in India that's almost been suppressed in the media because of the president and how he keeps control of that. And the fact that he was able to slide that in as a potential change of the nation and a complete cleansing of the nation to keep it just of like Hindi and of um, Hindu religion, you can see that a lot of presidents are probably doing the same, sliding into their ulterior motives behind these chaotic walls. And just like how Russia's representative was able to get up there and speak so like straightforwardly that Ukraine came and attacked us and everyone else, like no one had that kind of a move to, you know, say like otherwise. We did not even talk about North Korea. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think we will have time to discuss that. Yeah, so on that note, we have reached our hour and I think we are going to see some interesting developments over the next few months, purely because the world stage is shifting. And hopefully that cacophony of noise that is an uncoordinated song does actually turn into some type of music that's easier on the ear. So we will see. And so yeah, with all of that said, with, every, with the conversation today, thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you to the people that have followed us. Also, please feel free to like and subscribe to our Church of Union YouTube channel where you will find all our previous content and we look forward to seeing all of you next week. Thank you, everybody.